Hi guys, it's Katie. Welcome back to my channel. If you're new here. Hi, my name is Katie Wismer. I'm an author and an editor. I have seven books out currently. Today's video I'm excited about. I've been meaning to make this for quite some time and I've gotten a lot of requests for it. So I hope this ends up being helpful for those of you who've been asking for it. Today we're going to be talking about self-publishing on a budget. I've made quite a few money videos in the past, so I'll have those linked down below in the description if you haven't seen them yet on like the costs of self-publishing in general, how much I've spent on my individual books, what I think's worth it, all that kind of stuff. That's not what this video is going to be about. This one I mainly wanted to talk about if you are publishing your first book or you're still early in your career and you're really just getting started and you don't have the funds to be putting thousands of dollars into your books. You want to start your self-publishing career and you just can't afford to be spending a ton of money on books that haven't proven themselves, on books that you might not see a return on for years to come. What are the absolute essentials that you need to be spending money on no matter what your budget is, basically? What can you do without for a while and maybe you can, you know, go get that once the books start to make some money? What are some things you don't need to spend money on at all? But what are the things that I absolutely feel like you need to spend money on before you publish? There's obviously no like one right answer for everything. There's a lot of nuance to this and I think self-publishing in general, you gotta figure out what works for you and you have to build your career on your own. It's a very individualized thing. However, um, I've been publishing for about four years now. I have seven books out and I just wanted to share my thoughts on this, both from the indie author perspective, but I'm also a freelance editor, so I work with tons of other indie authors. So, I'm not an expert, but here are my thoughts. <laughs> if you have anything to add to the conversation, or if you disagree with me, agree with me, whatever, if you want to drop your thoughts down below in the comments, I'd love to see that as well. And thank you so much to Skillshare for sponsoring today's video. Skillshare is an online learning community for curious and creative people, and I actually think this is a great place to start if you're looking into getting into self-publishing. Skillshare does have just straight up writing classes and things like that, but when it comes to self-publishing, you're gonna have to teach yourself so many new skills. You're gonna have to wear every single hat because suddenly you're a business owner, you're not just a writer. So Skillshare is kind of a nice one-stop shop that has so many different topics in there that you're eventually gonna have to learn. So this might be a really great resource if you are just starting out and you're overwhelmed by all of these new skills you're gonna have to somehow figure out how to do. For example, there's this whole side of Skillshare just for marketing on TikTok, which if you've been around for a while, you know that's been a game changer for marketing my books the past year or so. Like this video about how to market yourself on TikTok as a creative professional if you're a little bit intimidated by starting to market your books on TikTok. Some of these introductory classes might be helpful to you. If you want to check them out, I'll have a link down below in my description. The first 1,000 people to use that link will get a one-month free trial which gives you access to all of their different classes. And without further ado, let's jump into the video. So first things first, let me just kind of give a general list of the kinds of things you could expect to pay for when it comes to self-publishing. There's more than this too, like there's a lot of things that you could spend money on, but kind of the basics. If you don't have any writer friends or connections in the community, you haven't started building a platform, you don't have any place to source beta readers, like reliable, good beta readers who can give you valuable feedback when your novel is in early stages and you're still editing, a lot of people will turn to paid beta readers. So you could be paying for beta readers, any writing software that you want to write in, and then you get into your editors, developmental editor, copy editor, proofreader, if you want to hire an interior formatter, if you don't want to hire an interior formatter and you get a formatting software, your cover designer, your ISBN numbers. If you're using Ingram Spark for your print distribution, they have setup costs and revision costs for every book that you do. Any marketing costs or ads that you're running. Printing costs if you are printing out proof copies or physical ARC copies to send to reviewers. And then if you are also doing audiobooks, you have to pay your audiobook narrator. Um, some other things that you might end up paying for if you wanted to get some character art commissioned, if you wanted to make merch or anything like that. Obviously those are not essential things, but I see lots of people do it. So just off the top of my head, I think those are the main ones. So now let me narrow into what is it that I think you absolutely need to spend money on. And then also some kind of workarounds and suggestions to cut some corners, save some costs if you need to. So I think first and foremost, there are two things that are the most important when it comes to publishing a book for you to spend money on. So if you're gonna be saving up money and you can only pick a couple of these things to spend on, these two things are most important. I would say in my opinion, but I also think this is kind of like an objective truth. I would be curious if anyone would disagree on this. 
and that is your cover and your editor, which is complicated because there are lots of different kinds of editors. But let's start with the cover. So having a professional cover that is attractive and eye-catching and makes your book stand out and makes people pay attention to it while also being a cover that is a good fit for the market and does an accurate job of showing what your book is about and what genre it fits into and fitting those genre expectations. This is arguably the most important thing when it comes to publishing your book because if you don't have any of this, if you don't have a cover that's doing what it needs to do, it doesn't matter how good your book is, no one's gonna pick it up. You could spend all the money in the world on marketing and it's not gonna do nearly as much as it could if you had a good cover. Your cover is your number one piece of marketing material and if you don't have a good cover there's only so much you can do. I know we'd all like to believe that people don't judge a book by its cover and people aren't so shallow but it's not even like people are gonna judge your cover or something. They might. But if people see a cover that just looks unprofessional or they don't really get it, it doesn't really fit with their expectations for the genre, they're not gonna give it a second thought. People are have the shortest attention spans. They've got a million books at their fingertips now. If they look at a cover and it's not doing what it needs to do, they're gonna scroll past. They're not gonna click and investigate some more and read your blurb and give it a chance. They're just gonna scroll. So you have like not even a second. You have like half a second to catch someone's attention with this cover. That is step one. That's not gonna seal the deal. There's other things that you need to do in order to convince people to read your book. But if you don't have the cover, that is step one. You're not gonna get much further without it. So in my opinion, the cover is the first thing to spend the money on. This doesn't mean you need to spend a lot of money on your covers either. I know some people drop like a thousand dollars or something on their covers. You don't have to do that. You don't need to be having unique photography where only you have the image or anything like that. You don't need that. I have a pretty wide range for how much my covers cost. Now, how much you're gonna be spending for the cover, it depends on your genre, it depends on your cover artist, obviously, and it's up to you and what you're comfortable paying. I think you can get a professional, good-looking cover, again, depending on your genre, for $200, $250, I would say, is a low price that, um, depending on the artist, you should be getting a good quality piece of work. The majority of my covers have been around $300, $400, maybe $250, somewhere in that range. And I'm really happy with all of my covers and I feel like that's a fairly reasonable price. So I do have a video talking about all of the resources that I would recommend for self-published authors and I've talked about the cover designers that I've worked with in that video so I can link that video down below if you'd like. But there are also plenty of other cover designers out there. I have a folder saved on my computer with all of these websites of cover designers that I think I might potentially work with in the future. So there are so many designers out there, do you research? I know they have websites for budget covers if you need like I think one's called like 100 covers or something and every cover on that website is $100. I would be wary of designers on things like Fiverr. There's issues with plagiarism, there's issues with them using images that they don't have the rights to and so then if you're putting that on your cover, the burden falls on you, not on them. So you're gonna be the one to get into trouble. So it is important to do your homework and to be working with a trustworthy designer and know where your cover is coming from but that doesn't mean you can't get an inexpensive one and potentially upgrade to a more expensive one once the money starts to come in. You can get a pre-made cover. Those are generally a lot cheaper. I'll put some resources down below in the description as well for affordable cover designers if you are really just looking for something that looks professional and it's gonna work for the initial release, but then maybe, you know, in the future you will upgrade to something that's a little better of a match for your book but if you just need something that's like eighty dollars a hundred dollars just to get your book out there in the first place i think that's a decent place to start then moving on to editors like i said there's lots of different kinds of editors which ones are worth it so you've got developmental copy line editors and then proofreaders the reason why i say that is there's no like one agreed upon definition for copy editors versus line editors. From my perspective, a line editor is more stylistic and that they're going to be looking at your word choice. Does this sentence read clunky? It's more subjective, whereas a copy editor, it's more technical. It's the grammar usage, it's your punctuation and your capitalization. Are there issues in the writing that is black and white, right or wrong? Whereas a line editor, 
might be like, I don't love this word choice. This paragraph is a little bit too long. This sentence, I think it would flow better if you did this. So a lot of the times if you have a line edit, it might help with your style, but you will also need a copy edit because it didn't fix all of the technical errors in there, or it may have introduced new technical errors if you're rewriting sentences. And then proofreading is something that's done after you've had the copy edit to fix any again issues that were introduced through making the changes in the copy edit or any little typos or things that are missed because we're all human you can't expect a 100 percent rate with any editor there was a statistic somewhere that for editors it's 90 to 95 percent of errors being fixed is a good rate for an editor so things still get missed that's why it's important to still do a proofread afterwards if you're hiring a developmental editor generally that's going to be your most expensive edit that really really ranges from editor to editor i've seen the most range in rights with this kind of editing and this is the one that if you are on a budget i would recommend skipping both because it's so expensive and also because i think there are workarounds that you can use that are free that i think a developmental edit is super important but as an indie author it's something that's really really hard to pay for on top of all the other kinds of things you're gonna have to do so developmental editing in general is the big picture stuff in your book so you are looking at plot holes arcs character development pacing all of these big picture things world building that kind of stuff so a developmental editor will be more experienced in spotting those issues and giving you actionable suggestions on how to fix them however if you are working with beta readers who are familiar with this genre and they read a lot they're going to be able to help you if you're working with alpha readers or critique partners who are other writers they're going to be able to help you with this developmental stuff as well you might have to go through several drafts revising and revising again having new people read it but it is possible to do this step in my opinion without hiring a developmental editor if you can afford it they're great if you can't it's not going to make or break your book as long as you are really trying to do the developmental work yourself and bringing in other opinions because you need at least one other person <laughs> to help you find these things because you are always going to have this bias as the person who wrote it where you're going to be blind to certain issues. You need other people to help you find these things. So in my opinion, if you are trying to cut costs, I would skip the developmental edit but try and bring in um, people who can help you in a free way instead. So then when it comes to line editing or copy editing, I would recommend if you can only spend money on one to do the copy edit. Again, line editing is great. Um, you should be line editing your own book. But again, I would be wary of paying for a line edit and then not paying for a copy edit afterwards. So if you can't afford to do both, I would spend a lot of time doing the line edit yourself. I would get in some second opinions if you have some friends who are willing to read it and point out some awkward sentences to you and things like that because you don't need professional editors to point out a lot of line editing things. If someone reads a lot they're gonna be able to pick up if something reads kind of weird or if this chapter was like moving really slow for them. You can get feedback from people who might not be able to articulate why they feel a way about something but they've read enough books that they know that they don't like this so and the more books that you put out there the more books that you read yourself the more editors you work with and you start to see these patterns showing up that you need to fix in your writing the better you'll get at line editing your own work so when it comes down to it i would personally recommend getting a copy edit done if you have to pay for one kind of editor i would try and bring on people who can help you with developmental editing and line editing who are not editors pay for the professional copy edit and then when it comes to proofread proofread yourself and get as many other eyes on that book to proofread it as well maybe offer for arc readers hey you can read the book early i'll send you the book if you help me proofread my mom proofreads all of my books spice and all so we love that i have friends who help me proofread i have beta readers who like to read the finished version after they helped with like an earlier draft so they also do a proofread for me while i also get to see how the story changed so proofreads are important but if you can only pay for one or the other i would recommend paying for the copy edit and then finding workarounds for the rest of the kinds of edits. Hi, so I'm editing this video and there was one other part of the editor discussion that I wanted to throw in here. So if you don't want to hire an editor at all, you do have some options and 
you might be surprised that I'm ad I'm not advocating for this. I'm just going to throw it out there because I know people do this. And as an editor myself, I have my thoughts about it, but I also can see it from both sides. So a lot of people will use programs like Pro Writing Aid or Grammarly or something, which is basically just a computer system program thing that you can run your writing through and it will flag errors. So if you already have these programs or if you feel like it's more cost effective to buy these and run your writing through them and then opt to not hire an editor, people do this. Um, as an editor myself, I've had clients be like, I've already run it through these programs, so I just need a proofread. And let me tell you, they did not just need a proofread. So computers can flag a lot of helpful stuff, but if you don't know what you're doing, if you don't know um, if it did a good job, if you can't tell if there are errors left, um, you don't know how... Let... <laughs> I'm trying to find the best way to phrase this, but... Um, the computer will not replace a human editor. There will be lots of errors left behind. It might introduce new errors if you don't know um, whether or not you should be listening to the suggestions it makes you. So I just wanted to throw that out there. This is a great tool if you want to run your writing through these programs before you send it to your editor. It could flag a lot of basic stuff for you and you could learn a lot from it, but I still think it's really important for your writing to go through human hands if you really care about your writing being error free. Now the reason why there's another piece to this discussion is um, on the one hand I really hate the negative attitude that a lot of people still have towards self-publishing but there's a reason for it. There's a lot of self-published books out there that are of a very poor quality and naturally as a buyer, as a consumer, if you're paying for something and then you get something that is full of errors, you're going to be upset because you're not getting what you paid for. You're expecting a high quality, you're expecting the book to be as high of a quality as a traditionally published book if that's the same price that you're paying for it, obviously. When it comes to whether or not editing is that important for your book, for me when I'm reading a book, if I'm noticing errors, it really bothers me. It really pulls me out of the story to the point where I'll put the book down. I can't read it. If it's poorly written, if it's poorly edited, I can't get through it. I can't look past that. I think I am in the minority when it comes to readers though. I think as an editor myself, I pick up on more errors when I'm reading than the average person does. And just from what I've seen with self-published books that have gone viral that are very successful with the kind of books that like book talk likes to read. I think a lot of readers don't care about that to be honest. Um, there will be some who will really really hate seeing errors in your books and they'll leave you one-star reviews for it and they will pick up on it but if you are writing in certain genres and you can't afford the editor, I am not telling you not to hire an editor but I am saying there are books out there that are selling stupid well. And they are so poorly written and they are so poorly edited and the readers do not care and the majority of the readers don't pick up on it. So in my opinion it's important to have a really high quality book and it's really important to have a fully edited book and I would never feel comfortable putting a book out there that I'm not proud of the quality and I haven't gone through and edited myself and I haven't hired a professional editor. But that's me and this is your career and this is, you know, you have to make your own decisions. But there are books out there that are incredibly successful that I can't read. I can't get through them. I've tried. I'm sure the story is great. But as an editor, there are so many errors that it like gives me a headache to try to read it. I can't do it. So, and they're incredibly successful. There are authors making six figures a month because of it. So, um, I don't know. Take that however you will, depending on what genre you're writing and what the reader expectations are for that genre. Just wanted to throw that out there. So, I was saying I have two things that I think are the most important to pay for. Your cover and your copy editor. Everything else I think you can do without at first if you only have enough money to pay for two things. When it comes to interior formatting, you can do it all yourself at Microsoft Word. I did that for my first two books. I have a video on it on my Patreon page. Um, there are plenty of free videos on YouTube here explaining the same thing. You can do it yourself. It's gonna take some time. It's gonna take a lot of trial and error, but you can do it yourself for free. I now use the software Vellum to format all of my books and I love it. I think it's well worth the cost. It's like a one-time purchase of $250. So at once it might seem like that's a lot of money. If you're planning on having a long career in publishing, 
you know, once you start dividing it down by like 25 books, it's $10 a book to format them at that rate. So I think it's definitely, in my opinion, better to get the software than paying an interior formatter every single time because you're gonna be spending a lot more money on that. As far as ISBN numbers go, I personally buy my own. So I obviously think it's worth it to pay for them, but it really just depends on what your goals are. You get them from Bowker, and this is also a US thing. I know it works differently in different countries. In some countries you don't have to pay for them, so if you're in one of those, take full advantage of that. If you saw one of my recent vlogs, I just had to buy some more. I can't remember what, if it was $400 or $600 to buy 100 because I ran out of my first pack. So they are expensive, but if you're planning on publishing wide and you have multiple forms of your book, like you have a paperback and a hardcover and audiobook, they all need an ISBN number. So I think it's important. I think it's best to just buy them in bulk. It is expensive, but you're going to run through them really quickly. Um, the alternative to this being if you don't want to buy your ISBN numbers, whatever print on demand company you're using will offer you a free ISBN number, free, but you can't use that ISBN number anywhere else. So the way it should work is you should have one ISBN number for your book in every place for that form. So if you have a paperback for your book on Amazon and then you have a paperback on Barnes & Noble and you have a paperback on Book Depository, they should all have the same ISBN number. If you're using a free Amazon ISBN number for your Amazon paperback, you cannot use that Amazon ISBN number in those other places to connect the book like you should be able to. Ebooks don't need ISBN numbers anymore, so that's nice. Um, if you just are starting out by only publishing an ebook, you don't have to worry about this yet, so we love that. Also, if you are publishing with your own ISBN number, you can list your publishing company name as the publisher. So for example, if you look at any of my books, the publisher shows up as a Hymns of Press. If you're using a free ISBN number from Amazon or something, I think it shows up as independently published or Amazon publishing or something and you don't have the option to change it if you care about that. Also correct me if I'm wrong, I know I've got some librarians who watch this, can people get their books into libraries if they don't have an ISBN number? I feel like they can't but I might be wrong. Okay speaking of like the paperback things and how you're setting up your books, if you're wanting to use Ingram Spark, which is what I use for my paperback distribution, if you care about your book being in as many places as possible, I do think Ingram Spark is the best option for doing that in print from all of the things that I've tried. And Ingram Spark is the only, I think the only, well the only one that I've tried of these print on demand companies that it costs money to set up your book, which is incredibly annoying. So if you want to set up a new book through Ingram Spark, it's $50. If you need to revise that file at any time, it's $25 for every single revision. So if you need to go back in and fix a typo or you want to update your cover or update your back matter, you have to pay every single time you update the file. So the reason for using Ingram Spark is it's going to get your book into more places than if you're only publishing through Amazon. So for example, my books are on Book Depository and Target and Walmart and Barnes and Noble and Booktopia and I don't even know how many places, lots of places. It makes them more available to people who shop in different places. It makes them available to people in other countries to get the physical copy. So I like using Ingram Spark because I feel like it helps more people have access to my book, especially considering my eBooks are exclusive to Amazon and they're in Kindle Unlimited. So for me, it's important to have the physical copies available in as many places as possible. So with that said, the way that I work around those Ingram Spark costs is I have a membership to Ally, which is the in Alliance of Independent Authors or something like that. So this is a yearly cost. I want to, I don't know exactly how much my membership is. It's over a hundred dollars, but that's for the full year. And in being a member to this, you get a free code for Ingram Spark. You can upload new books and revise them for free. So if you're publishing more than two books in a year, it pays for itself. Or if you're publishing one book and you end up revising it five times, it pays for itself. The membership has tons of other benefits and uses as well. So if you're interested in using Ingram Spark and you want a slightly more cost effective way to do that, I would highly recommend getting a membership through them. That's what I do. If you're just starting out, um, I don't think it's super necessary to worry about as wide of distribution as possible 
because you're still building a readership and I don't think it'll be as big of a deal right at the beginning. So this isn't something I think you have to worry about right away if you don't want to. Printing costs for proofs and arcs, I would recommend doing all of your arcs digitally to help with costs and everything. I personally use BookFunnel in order to do that. You do have to pay for BookFunnel. I've done free versions of this in the past. If you get someone's Kindle email, you can send it directly to their Kindle or you can email them a PDF or something like that. And a lot of people are kind of weird about this. They're worried about people stealing and pirating books and stuff and it is a real concern trust me i know but i would recommend doing digital arcs instead of physical arcs to cut back costs but i would recommend especially if you formatted the book yourself and this is the first time you're formatting a book order the physical proof of your book to make sure everything looks okay just do it <laughs> and then um for audiobooks audiobook narrators and things like that if you're just starting out i wouldn't even get near audiobooks would not would not <laughs> i love my audiobooks love them so glad i did them expensive takes a long time to make your money back on them not a priority if you're just starting out and you're trying to keep costs down don't go anywhere near them <laughs> i have a whole video on audiobooks if you want some more information but i think that was everything on my list oh yeah for marketing and ads and things like that i've personally had more success in all of my free marketing things that i've tried rather than any paid marketing i've tried a lot of paid marketing i've tried ads i've tried book tours and blog tours and book blitzes and cover reveals and everything under the sun and I swear to god the free resources that you have with the internet and social media nowadays work better every single time. So if you are trying to cut costs there are so many free ways that you can market your book that I think work better. So I wouldn't spend money on that personally. Oh my gosh I've been talking for a long time. If you have any questions feel free to let me know. If you're looking for recommendations for anything I've talked about feel free to let me know. I'll have links for resources down below in the description as well if you're also an author. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, what you think are the most important things, if you have little tips and tricks to cut some costs for everybody watching. I'd love to hear them too. I think that's gonna be it. I think so. Um, if you wanna follow me over on Patreon, it's a pay what you can system. No matter what tier you're a part of, you get access to everything. And I post bonus videos about the business of self-publishing over there every single month. I have a backlog of, I don't even know at this point, at least like 50 videos now with a lot of how-to stuff. But I also have over 500 videos on this YouTube channel that are totally free if you are looking for free content. So fear not. Yeah, that's it. That's it for the video. I'll see you guys in the next one very, very soon. Bye. No.